every month, the quartermaster dietitians make a master menu. Yes, these nutrition men have an entirely different attitude toward food than you or I have. Everyone's heard the famous story about the great French thinker, René Descartes, who shut himself in a nice warm room and asked what truths he could really be sure of. After one day, he is supposed to have said there was just one thing, I think, therefore I am. But I am thinking, on the contrary, that after one day he would surely have been asking a much deeper philosophical question, which most of us ask ourselves at least three times a day, which is, what to eat? And this is indeed a question that the world's great thinkers, both past and present, have tackled and shed considerable light on. Now, lots of people want advice on diet and health, and there's plenty about. But the advice, both popular and scientific, is contradictory, and people are confused. That's where philosophy comes in. Because philosophy, at its best, involves stripping down complex issues to their essential cause and presenting the big ideas via thought-provoking examples. There's been a lot of talk lately about sugar being bad for you. Which is a bummer, because sugar is the best, right? I mean, who doesn't like sweetness? But sugar, pretty much everyone likes the sweet, sweet taste of sugar. But now some scientists are saying sugar is toxic. Really, scientists? Couldn't you have just looked the other way on this one? Now, okay, you see. But what has a philosopher got to say about food matters anyway? And I know what you mean, because philosophy has a reputation for being about vague and shadowy things, usually rather grand, and of looking down on practical things, everyday things like, well, what to eat. Yet when you look into food science and nutrition, the one thing that is immediately striking is how little is agreed, and how much is instead the subject of bitterly divided opinions. It is in areas where facts are disputed, and competing theories abound, that philosophers should be playing a role, offering a kind of bird's eye view of a philosopher's seal of objectivity. Take sugar for example. Not so long ago, TV commercials made wonderful claims for the white stuff, saying that it actually was great for the weight watchers as it curbed appetite and gave you energy. Even in recent years, gym fanatics, who wouldn't touch a piece of pizza, have been pouring sugary drinks down them after each session, content as long as the drink was labelled high energy. Now though, the emphasis is all on how evil sugar is. The long-running debate has shifted, and all sugars, even in things like apples and oranges, are being viewed with suspicion as potential health risks. It's precisely when two very good cases can be made for completely opposed and irreconcilable positions that you need to turn to a philosopher. And my book will teach you the truth about food like sugar and other things from an objective, philosophical viewpoint. You'll also learn why you don't actually need to eat more fibre or drink more water, why French baguettes are worse than a handful of sugary bonbons, and why we can all continue to eat spaghetti very, very slowly. Mm -hmm.